it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our special guest. We are truly honoured to be joined by a very special guest tonight, a giant in the business world, but perhaps even more importantly, a true architect of the Jewish community for over 50 years. Many young people may not know or perhaps appreciate all that he has done for the freedoms and security we have today. So, I make no apologies for this extended introduction, as I hope by the end of this interview, it will be clear to, all, clear to all of you and us that we are better, safer and stronger British Jews because of this man. Gerald Ronson, CBE, is a British business tycoon and philanthropist, the CEO of Heron International and best known for founding and chairing the CST, which serves and protects the British community. Growing up during the Second World War, Gerald was born in 1939 in Paddington and left school at the age of 15 to work in his father's furniture business. After a successful move into property, by 1967, the Heron Company, named after his father, Henry Ronson, was active in seven European countries and 52 British municipalities. And by 1989, Gerald was listed by the Times Rich List as having a net worth of over 500 million pounds. But it hasn't always been easy for Gerald who in 1990 served six months in prison for alleged share trading fraud as part of the Guinness 4 scandal, something Gerald has said he is happy to talk about this evening. And then not long after, had, he had to overcome the commercial property crash of the 1990s, which saw his family business personally lose over a billion pounds. In his autobiography, Leading from the Front, which many of us have been reading in, pre in preparation for tonight's interview, as always, Gerald fought back and set about the rebuilding both of his business and his reputation, where in the year 2000, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that the trial in 1990 had been unfair. Alongside many well-known historical names from both the GLGB and our friends at Ajax, Gerald was part of the founder groups that fought fascism in the 1960s as the forerunners to what the Jewish community now knows as the Community Security Trust. The CST, since founded by Gerald in 1994, has valiantly protected Jewish community events, clubs, and buildings. For over 25 years, working alongside the police, the Home Office, and the Prime Minister. The Ronson Family Foundation is also one of the largest foundations in the Jewish community, giving over 10 million pounds each year in grants and donations. In 2012, Gerald was rightly rewarded with a CBE for his services to charities, a nice addition to his wife, Gail, who was made a Dane eight years earlier. The incredible family supports a range of causes, including Jewish care, the RNIB, the Royal Ballet, the new Holocaust Memorial due to be built next, next to Parliament, and the creation of Jacob's School, for which Gerald is their life president. He doesn't give many interviews, so we are especially grateful he has been able to take time out of his incredibly busy schedule to chat with us this evening, as he has such an incredible story to tell us all. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome tonight's honoured guest, Mr. Gerald Ronson, CBE. Good evening, Gerald. We're so excited to have you on the show tonight. How are you? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. How, how are you tonight? I'm good, thank you. So, how's lockdown been treating you? Are you keeping positive? Uh, well, I think after nine weeks, I had enough of it and I've been back working since the first of the month. So, it's what, uh, nearly three weeks. And uh, I feel a lot better. Very painful, I must say being locked down it's not my style to run a business on the telephone and uh, you know as i employ something like 3500 people in my retail business you know it's a business that's in my dna and i enjoy being out in the field and visiting my sites and all the people that have worked for us a very hands-on approach so i'm known for that <laughs> we're really pleased to have you on our GLGB virtual program tonight and so we've been trying to boost positivity and keep children and their families active healthy and entertained for over 13 weeks now since lockdown began 
with the help of a special guest helping us each evening. So why was it important for you to join us this evening? You asked me. <laughs> I mean, I have I'd a say precedent. I'm happy to do it. And I'm happy to talk about whatever questions people want to ask me. And uh, you know, it's all about how I am. I lead from the front. And uh, if it, if it's of in interesting for young people to learn the challenges of life, the responsibilities to our community, because although I'm not a religious Jew, I'm very, very Jewish, uh, you know. So therefore, you know, going to shul is one thing, wearing a kippur is something else. It's how you express and how you behave is what I do. I mean, I don't think anyone's going to be doubting that you aren't a massive pillar of the national Jewish community and, ab and abroad. And speaking about leading from the front, so we've been reading your book, and I discovered that your father was actually a member of the Jewish Lads Brigade, or as JLGB is. Yes, yes, today. he was in the, in, in the 30s. And uh, my, my father was a very successful furniture manufacturer, so I don't come from rags to riches. Um, and uh, in his time, back in 36, he was light ABA heavyweight champion. And, uh, you know, he was very much involved. Um, but as time went on from 36, after he became the light heavyweight champion, he wasn't gonna, his life wasn't to be a professional boxer. He, he trained actually as a cabinet maker. That's how he, that's how he was successful and built up a large furniture business. Uh, and so when talking about your father and obviously he's kind of he did have the fighting spirit he was a boxer he even won the coveted prince of wales trophy so do you think that if you don't mind could you tell us whether your father and his influence had uh, and his fighting spirit shaped the fighter that you became without question without doubt because um my father was a very successful man i, I have a younger brother that's knight lawrence ronson who's mark ronson's father uh and he's nine years younger than me. Uh, but I was much closer to my father. And uh, my, my father wanted to see me being successful. Um, and he was exceptionally proud of me. Uh, I started working in the furniture factory, not 15 actually, 14 and a half. Uh, because I... I went to school at Clark's College in Cricklewood and really I couldn't wait to get out of school. In fact, in the afternoons from about 10 years of age onwards, two, three times a week, I would get the bus and go down to the factory, which was in uh, uh, New North Road in Islington and, uh, you know, just walk around. I mean, I had, I had that business in my blood. But we'll come on later as to how I changed from being a furniture manufacturer to being a property developer, as you've as you've read in the book, and how we went from furniture into the property business. And I remember my father saying to me over breakfast, you know, I think we've had enough of this furniture business. We've got the unions taking control. We're working for the few major retailers who all the time want to chip the price back, chip the price back. And he says, I think this factory that you're going to build, when we finish building it, we're going into the property business. Because he said, look at these people in the property business, like Charlie Claw, like uh, Max Rain, all these famous names, etc. He said, he said, you can be every much as clever as they are. They're not, they're, there's nothing that special about them. Of course, I used to look at these people to an extent in awe. But I thought, well, you know, maybe dad's right. And that's, that was the beginning after we built that big factory, which I was partially responsible, which he gave me the responsibility of doing, which very few fathers would do, if any others at all. And, you know, I learned, I learned the business. You know, I've been, in the, I've been in the property business for most probably, what, 65 years? That's a long time. I've built, you know, in nine countries around the world, developments. I've built uh, in the UK, 
in, I don't know, 60 towns, 70 towns, major town centres from the Cardiff town centre, Hoddesdon town centre, uh, Sunderland town centre, 15,000 houses, even over 1,000 petrol stations. But we'll come to that business later on uh, because I invented the modern self-service petrol station, uh, which I built over 1,000 in the UK and 150 in America. So, yeah, was I busy working? Yes. I wanted to make my father proud of me. He was very proud of me. But funny enough, he never told me personally that, you know, like the old Jewish grandfather or father who never really tells his son what a good job he's doing. But on the other hand, if he meets you or meet other people over dinner, he would say, oh, my son, Gerald, he's going to do this and he's going to do that. So I suppose I, when that came back to me, I thought I'd better do it. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm glad you kind of brought it up and we will definitely go into it because it, as you said, you came from a very successful furniture business, but the difference between that and this empire that you fashioned, it's astronomical, the success that you've had. So before we get onto that, I, I, I want to touch on, because you famously founded the CST, but before then you've been fighting anti-Semitism yourself since the 1960s. But it's yeah, very... I've been involved in fighting anti-Semitism <laughs> for 60 years. And as a boy of 21, when the fascists... See, people of your generation don't realise that the fascists in those days, which are street, right-wing, toe rags, rubbish people, were beating up little old Jewish men in Stanford Hill and in other places and being exceptionally anti-Semitic, you know, desecration of, st of the stones in, in, the, in, the, in the crematoriums, in daubing, but most of all, they were beating up Jews. And there was a group of us, which started with the 43 group, but developed into the 62 group, that decided enough was enough. The, the leadership of the Jewish community, i.e. the Board of Deputies, they wanted to turn the other cheek. But we were a crew of 200 guys. I mean, there were some very, very tough guys. And some of them were Jewish villains. There was a lot of Jewish villains in those days, you know, whether they were bookmakers or, or taxi drivers or whatever, but really tough people who were prepared, who were street fighters. And we hunted down these fascists. We did a lot of things I can't say I'm proud of, but I'm not, not proud of it. And we never had guns or knives, but we did have everything else from knuckle dusters to coshes to you name it. And we went round and we dealt with these people and we actually got them off the streets because in those days the police were defending these extreme right-wing hooligans who were attacking Jews and that can't be tolerated. You know, a Jew has to be able to walk down the street, whether he's got a big black hat and payers and whatever, whatever, but he has to be proud and not be frightened if he's walking down the street, whether it's in Stanford Hill, Golders Green, Ilford, wherever. So we had to protect these people, which we did, and we dealt with these fascists who were bad people, and they, they were scared of us. You know, when they'd all meet in their pub, they're all very strong and very powerful. But when they would see 25 really tough Jews who can fight, they'd run away. And I know because I was there. But I, and, you know, I, I wasn't frightened to be there. But it wasn't my business going around beating people up. I'm not a bully. But isn't to see the impact you were having even then on your community and how you were helping it, even though you're not necessarily proud of what you did. Well, I'm so, not, not proud of it, not, not but proud. it's not something that I'm, I'm bragging about. Yeah. But then to see that impact is a, it's certainly the fact that you've done something good for your community is, does that obviously that itself just, we all have a, we all have a responsibility in our community as Jews. I'm a middle of the road Jew. And my responsibility 
was to deal with the bad people and get them off the streets. Because I can't tolerate Jews being beaten up and bullied. We know anti-Semitism is there. It was, it was, it was a different sort of anti-Semitism in those days. You know, we're looking at today and have been with Corbyn, intellectual anti-Semitism, but it only needs to move a little bit to the right when all the other rubbish people can come out and, and we'll see the same pattern again. They'll be beating up Jews, that they're starting to be stabbing them and attacking schools, etc., where a Jew will be frightened to walk down the street. Well, we can't live in a country like the United Kingdom and not be able to walk down a street or get the children going to school and getting beaten up either going in or going out of school. I mean, we've gone through all this period. It's not something that we need to make a lot of noise about, but we have to be aware of it. We're only a small community. What have we got? Depends who I'm talking to. I'm talking to you. I'll tell you, there's under 300,000 Jews in this country. And I could then break down that 300,000 to those that really will stand their ground or those that have a real responsibility or those that hide. And as we got a lot of Jews that do hide. Assimilation has been a problem in terms of creating that situation. But, you know, as Jews and as young men, we have a responsibility. And that responsibility is part of our community. That makes us what we are, makes us strong, makes us successful in different areas outside of business, doctors, scientists, musicians, etc., etc. And we're a very vibrant community. But we have to realize there's a lot of nasty people out there without going over the top in this area that would like to damage us. That's the extreme left and the extreme right. Because don't think we're all talking about black people and talking about, you know, how hard done by they've been, etc., etc. Well, we all know as Jews, six million of us perished in the Holocaust. Six million. And we know how tough it was to rebuild communities from that rebuild Israel or build Israel, create Israel. So, you know, I'm not a Jew that runs backwards and forwards to Israel, although I'm very proud. I've got two grandchildren there. My oldest was a lieutenant in the army and is now at university studying law and economics. I have a, a, a my oldest granddaughter. She's studying to be a doctor. And my grandson was born in England my granddaughter was born in Israel and, uh, you know, I'm very proud of both of them, just as I've got nine grandchildren, just as I'm proud of my other seven grandchildren. Uh, but they feel and fight and believe in terms of what they are. They're not religious. I mean, I must be quite honest about it. But, you know, again, coming to what I said to you earlier on, how you express yourself as a Jew doesn't mean you're a good Jew because you go to shul every day and daven x times a day. I mean, I say my shemar every morning, but I don't like to fill in. And why do I say it seven days a week? Because that's my communication with the good Lord. I believe in God. And God's been good to me. I might have gone through nightmares of going to prison and all the aggravation which I had to go through but I knew he was there he protected me through all of this I didn't have any problem when I was in prison in fact just the reverse and he was there he was there to protect me and I have a responsibility and that's why you know I've put back because I've given away hundreds of millions to the foundation and what the foundation does, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but 80% of what my foundation has to do and can give its money to, whereas 
it's public knowledge how much money's in it. So uh, uh, I'm not inventing anything. It's it's what I believe in. Yeah, and we'll get on to your charity because it's a massive. It's a massively impressive thing, and we'll get on to your charity in just a moment. But so you recently met with Sakir Starmer, the new leader of the Labour Party. And well, I've met you. I've met him a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. Are you are you happy that the issue of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party is finally being addressed? Well, I think it's being it's it's being addressed, but I don't see too many people booted out as yet. I've heard I've heard and listened to the talk, but you know I don't have to make a long speech about it. When I see it, not being talked about, but actually happening, which I is. He's assured me that he's dealing with it, and I believe I believe him. Uh, but the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and you know we at CST, because as you know, we've got two and a half thousand volunteers in CST, and we've got over one hundred and ten professionals. And uh, you know where we can help. Forget the politics. Because I'm for working with good people. I don't mind whether they come from the left, the right, the centre, or wherever. And I've done that all my life. Then let's see, let's see the action. And thank you for that. And if we can move on now to you very kindly said that you're happy to talk about your prison experience. And so clearly you've bounced back. But and when I'm sure many people in your position at the time might not have but what was prison actually like and did it change you as in what lessons did you take from no, your experience look, you don't meet nice people in prison it's mm. not Butlin's holiday camp um <laughs> but the fact of life is um yeah i mean i didn't i didn't have any problems um uh strangely enough you know in the recent business with black people etc etc um, I do think in prison, black people suffer more than white people who are there. And I saw a number of situations where I felt that uh, the black prisoner was being uh, wrongly, badly treated. And uh, I went to see the governor and I told him, this is an on. You've got certain officers here that uh, are mistreating prisoners. And I'm talking about black people and it's wrong and it's got to stop. Now, they were nervous of me there, the governor and the people that were there because they knew I have powerful friends outside in the press, et cetera, et cetera. And all they wanted to do was actually get me out of there. If they could have sent me home the following day that I went there, they'd have been happy because they were worried, you know, someone was to stab me or some this, that or the other. I didn't have any problems with that. I mean, I've dealt with enough hooligans and enough rubbish people in my life that I wasn't going to be intimidated by a little zoo down in Sussex. So I dealt with it. Now, what lessons did I learn? Very few. Uh, but uh, did it make me stronger? I don't know. I got myself very fit when I was in there. Um, so uh, from that point of view, I'm fortunate, I have a very good family, as you know, I've been married for 53 years to a wonderful woman who I met when she was 19 years of age. And uh, yeah, you know, if you've got a good family and you've got support, you can, you can come through these things. And most important of all, if you know you didn't do anything wrong, I mean, not only did I have an unfair trial, they made, they made the law up and made the changes in the law after the game was played. And, you know, again, major elements of anti-Semitism. I, I didn't have any issues with anti-Semitism in prison. And I had black people there, all sorts of people there, and 36 murderers there as well. I mean, you know, you don't meet nice people. Nice people aren't in prison. There may be one or two people out of 550 that didn't do what they've gone into prison. Then, but I can assure you, the other... 98% are all people that have done lots and lots of bad things. 
otherwise it wouldn't be there. And you said that since going, you've been reciting the Shema seven days a week, and as I was wondering, I did that. I did that when I was in prison. Yeah, as I was wondering, so what was the reason? What what made you start doing that? What made me start doing it? I don't know. I did. I just started doing it. I just felt that it started before I went to prison and before the Guinness thing came to a finality because it went on for nearly, it started in 86 when it was um, December the 1st, 86. It was the time when it when it blew up in the sense of it could develop into a legal issue. I remember that. And I don't know, I, I started saying my uh, the Shema, it's not difficult to say, is it? And Hope I can tell you a lot of story about it, but it will take too long um, about how, when I was uh, convicted and I was in in the cells underneath the court, this rabbi managed to come in and see me, a bit like the man and his last wishes. <laughs> and uh, it's it's a I'm, I'm not going to tell you the story. When I see you, I'll tell you the story because it'll take up too much time. But I knew when I said those prayers that morning and I laid to fill in with him, I knew the Lord would protect me. And he did through everything. With the murderers I met there, with all rotten people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody intimidated me. I was in a little zoo down in Sussex at Ford, you know. So at any rate, move on. So now we're going to our audience. And first off, we're going to have Sydney Miller, who is a member of the Jacob School that you obviously know very well. So Sydney? Hiya. And um, right. thank you so much for coming on the show. Your answers really are inspirational and it's so interesting to hear you speak. Um, my question for you, though, is thanks to you and the CST and with government support, you have ensured Jewish schools in the UK are safe. But you've also supported the physical building of many schools, both in Israel and here in the UK, including my school, JCOS, for which you are our life president. Why has Jewish education been so important to you? Well, look, you understand why it's important. You go to one, you go to my school. Not only was I the founder of that school, not only did I get the money, 40 million pounds from the government, not only did I have to raise then another 10 million plus what we put in. Again, it comes back to what I'm talking about leading from the front. And you know the success of the school mm -hmm. because you go there and, you know, it is, it is what I believe in because the school you go to is a middle of the road school. You know, it takes non halachic children. I don't sit in judgment of who's halachic, not halachic, or whatever. If you want to be Jewish, then the door's open as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Sydney. And now we're going to be going to Amy. Hi, Amy. Hi. Um, my question is, why do you think it's important for the UK to have a National Holocaust Memorial and Learning Centre in Westminster next to Parliament? And how is the development going? Very simple. I've got six million reasons for building that. And when I was asked by David Cameron to set up the committee to build it and get it delivered, I didn't realise what a nightmare it was going to be at the time. But it, as he was very supportive to putting up the substantial government money that I get for CST, but not for running CST, but for the operation of the protection of schools and synagogues throughout the United Kingdom, uh, I, was, I was landed with a job. Well, here we are. 
five years later, albeit found the site, albeit dealt with most things in terms of its budget, its cost. Originally, the government were putting in 50 million. They now subsequently increase it to 75 million. I've got the job of raising 25 million, so because it's going to cost 100 million pounds. You know, there should be a great memorial to the Jews. You know, six million of us were murdered. We were murdered, you know. <laughs> And it is unforgivable in whichever way you want to look at it. And now people make up stories where it wasn't and it's a hoax and it's this and it's that, etc., etc. Hopefully the minister who's called the planning in, hopefully with the government inquiry, which will take place starting from October onwards, we'll have a decision hopefully by January, February, but it will then take two and a half years to build it because the bulk of it is underground. Uh, and, you know, I feel very strongly about it. And when I've got some namby-pamby Jews in our community that turn around and say, why are you doing it? It's going to create more anti-Semitism. Go and build it up in the Midlands or go and build it where, you know, I, I found that site and that site, that location is the best location in the United Kingdom next to the House of the Parliament, next to the House of Lords to build it. Why? Where, why? Are these objectors there? Because most of them are a bunch of anti-Semites. And that's why they're objective. Because otherwise, a, a park that is very run down, miserable, we are creating a beautiful landscape park, not just building this memorial and this learning centre. So I hope that gives you an answer. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. So now we're going to go to Izzy. Hi. Hi, um, I have a few questions. Your nephew, um, Mark Ronson, musician, yes. DJ, songwriter and record producer, did you know when he was growing up that he had such a talent and did you help guide him from a business pers perspective and does music run in the family? Uh, well, his father was all, always interested. That's my bro younger brother who's nine years younger than me. Um, in fact, he did when we won the European Song Festival with Bucks Fizz. He was the manager of Bucks Fizz. He's always been interested in that business, the entertainment business. Um, my uh, nephew, he's a lovely young man uh, and uh, he's, he's very able, very talented. And uh, I, I don't advise him financially in any shape or form. And... Uh, He's, he's done it on his own bat, and I respect that. Thank you. Right, thanks, Izzy. And now we're going to go to Joel. Hi, Joel. Hey, yeah, Gerald. Thank you so much for coming on, Joel Gudacho. Um, I'm also a member of uh, JCOS and CST volunteer. Um, so thank you for everything that you've been doing. Good for you. Thanks. Um, a two-part question. You brought self-service petrol stations to the UK in 1996. Now, I didn't bring it to the UK. I've edited self-service petrol stations uh, that you, the, that you okay. see. Yeah, so you invented them. Um, how were you able to pioneer this new concept back then? And secondly, climate change, the environment, and renewable energy are passions of mine and lots of young people in this country. Um, is this an area or a cause, you and Rontech, have been looking at and do you have plans to develop other sorry I, the, the line broke i didn't hear the bit before as to what it is that you were looking at or sorry doing. um uh, my second did you hear my first question no not clearly it was okay. intermediate breaking um so you brought you invented self-service petrol stations in the uk in 1996 how are you able to pioneer this new concept back and secondly, climate change, the environment, and renewable energy are passions of mine and lots of young people in this country. And is this an area or cause you and Rontech have been looking at? And do you think that you have plans to develop the forms of clean energy or even electric cars? Well, I think you will see a development. It's going to take longer than what the politicians and a lot of people talk about. But I think the sophisticated hybrid is the move forward, which doesn't need plug-in. And you've seen uh, uh, the Lexus, you see advertised, 
that that is a car that the, your petrol engine will get it going, but you're generating your power for the battery as you're going along. Uh, until they actually perfect the battery and you've got a car that can basically do four to 500 miles, there's very, you can't believe any of the figures they tell you what the electric car is doing. Because yeah. if you're on a flat road going along at 30 miles an hour, uh, with no stopping and starting, you may do your 200 miles that they say the car will do. I'm not talking now about uh, the American car. I'm talking about the general cars, the European cars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you end up doing most probably 60% of what they tell you that it can do. So you know you've got to have the confidence if you've got a proper car. If you've got to drive up to Manchester or you're going to drive up to Newcastle, whether it's 200 miles or 350 miles or whatever. Uh, and the other thing is you've got to develop the the turbo charge, which the car, you can charge a car in six minutes. Um, now, do I think the, 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 the factor of separate energy, lower emissions, etc. Yes, it is going to develop and it's right and responsible that it does. I mean, we make our real profits out of the stores uh, that we have on our, on our sites. And I'm not ready to you know spend millions at this particular stage on putting in electricity everywhere because i think there's going to be developments there's going to be a standard plug uh there's, there's, it all sounds very good and it sounds very good when bp turn around and say well we're going to become a country a, com a company and we're going to you know save the world and we're going to sort of have green energy etc 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 it's all going to take a lot longer it's right and proper that over a period of years these things will happen but you've got to remember governments are getting about 40 billion a year in the UK for tax and fuel etc 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 right now it's not a priority I can assure you uh, the government's got other big problems to resolve but we're working with government in terms of mm. this the this matter what we're talking about uh, but you know, I don't think it's going to happen too much in my lifetime, and I'm 81. So does that mean, sorry for a follow-up question, um, does that mean you think that the um, government target of having zero emissions uh, by 2050 is realistic? Well, 2050, when we're in 2020, that's a long way down the road. That's 30 years. Maybe time we get 50 years down the road, and we don't know what the shape of the world is. I mean, if we look at the world as it is today, and we look at where we were a year ago, you know, it's totally upside down, isn't it? And, yeah. and electric cars or of, of a kind, there is so much technical work to be done, which is being done. I mean, from advancements in batteries, in terms of the weight, in terms of the power, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's all got a long way to go. You're a young man. Hopefully you'll see it in your lifetime. Hopefully. Thank you very much for your answer. Thanks, Joel. So now we're going on to Alfie. Hi. Hi. So I've Hi, got Alfie. A few questions to ask, but I'll ask them separately. So first Can you is... speak up a little bit, please? Sure. Is this better? That's better, yes. Okay. So first question is, the coronavirus had a devastating effect on the economy. How has it affected the way you run your business? Well, bearing in mind the stores uh, which sell food, etc. You know, they're Morrison stores, but we own the property and we operate the sites. Um, on the big stores where we got, uh, you know, Lord, large convenience stores, they are 25% up. We look at petrol, that was down 60% and then it moves up to 50%. When I say 60%, 60% down. So we're rising up. Last week was 70% of pre-lockdown. Um, now the prices are down, which is good for the motorist, uh, et cetera, et cetera, because the price of oil's come down. Uh, so is margins of profit. Uh, so we're keeping our heads above water. We're not, 
You yeah. know, would 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 I like to be doing better? Of course, I like to be doing better, but we're we're all right. I'm not I'm not complaining, especially when I look around at most of these other businesses. Yeah, exactly. I think everyone's in the in the same position. So, second question is: Although you pride yourself on remaining politically neutral, are you happy with how the government has responded initially? In which way? You mean you mean you mean towards the Jewish community, or do you mean? I think towards the business. As far as COVID is concerned, or what? The business. The business. You mean the business at large, the economy? Yeah. Well, yeah. well, I think uh, a conservative party would always be better for business uh, than a Labour government of in course. terms of profitability. Um, but uh, you know, as far as the, as far as Mr. Corbyn was concerned, well, I don't have to tell you, you know, he was not a savoury gentleman, and he was not a friend of the Jews. Although he says, like a lot of anti-Semites, oh, I've got some good friends who are yeah. Jews. Um, and uh, I've known Boris for a long time. I knew him when he was mayor. I worked with him uh, in developments in London, etc., etc. And uh, you know. He's a good guy. He's got a lot of inexperienced young politicians around him. Maybe that's what he chose. Well, it's not maybe what he chose. He, he did choose. Um, so let's see. I mean, at the moment, uh, he's not had an easy time since he's been in power. So yeah. uh, I think it's important that we see how they develop and be supportive. I'm, when I say be supportive, I don't give any politicians money any political party. I can help with the schools and I can help with lots of things that I do through the foundation, but uh, you won't find uh, our name, the Bronson family, uh, in terms of giving any money uh, to any political parties. I'm not in business to do that. I'm, I'm very independent. Yeah. And lastly, as someone who has survived a previous economic crisis, are you confident in the country's plans to come out of lockdown and to rebuild the economy? The reason I'm hesitating, your good question, is I, I think we have to come through this and hopefully we won't get a second bout of it. Um, Hopefully. You know, the time this is finished, this is going to most probably cost not 300 billion, but 500 billion. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of unemployment after September. I think a lot of people that have been on furlough are not going to be uh, having a uh, job to come back to. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't even want to go back to work because they're nervous. I mean, until we actually get a vaccine and people feel confident to actually go out, go to a pub, go to a restaurant, go to a health club, go to the cinema or theatre, or even go to work. Because people have got so used to sitting and working from home. But I don't believe if you're running a proper business, you can have everybody sitting at home because you can't run it on a telephone. I mean, yeah. I'm speaking for somebody who runs a very big business and uh, I have very good management who do run it. Every business needs a boss who knows, understands detail, detail of a business and know just like a, a concert pianist knows what keys to touch on the board. So I think we're in for plenty of problems. Thank you very much for answering the questions. That's okay. Thank you. So we've got one more question from the audience then if it's all right with you, could we do uh, just a few more questions from me? Yeah, sure. We'll right. Sure. So a final question from the audience comes from Samuel. Hi there. Uh, Hi, Samuel. Uh, thank you for coming and uh, thank you for everything you've done for the community. And uh, my question is that um, on the topic of uh, philanthropy and giving to good causes, um, there's assuming there's presumably a quite a sharp increase in like the the request from those charities that are like in crisis and are on the risk of going into bankruptcy and, and going into um, and families in need since the lockdown began and have you tried to meet these these unprecedented demands? Yeah, we've, we, we've, 
the foundation uh, will has right from the beginning pumped in a lot of money, very substantial monies into the likes of Jewish care and other Jewish organizations, uh, Jewish leadership, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, also different sets of funds which we set up to help very poor Jews uh, so their family shouldn't be short of food, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, that's, that is why one has a big foundation. If, and if you have it, you've got a responsibility to give it away. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I don't have a problem about giving money away. You know, God's been good to me. I've made a lot of money. I've always been involved in Jewish care, at Jewish education, Israel. We've got, I've got nearly 9,000 children every day go to schools, which we've built. And therefore, yes. Uh, but unfortunately, we also have a lot of rich people in our community that don't put their hand deep enough in their pocket. It's one of my pet uh, hates. Yeah, I can, I can, I can imagine. I'm a doer. I lead from the front. God gave me that job, and I can't escape from it. Well, it's it's all my it's... family. You know, all my daughters. I've got four daughters, as you may or may not know. Uh, I mean, they all play a part. They've all been brought up on charity, on Sadaka. They are all involved, whether it's in Israel, my daughter who runs the foundation there, uh, and whether it's my three other daughters who live here, they're all involved in projects. I mean, if we talk about the school, my daughter, Nicole, is uh, very involved with regard to... Uh, Jacos on the fundraising side because we we're going to do a further expansion there, having developed the sixth form, uh, and you know dealing with that. Lisa, uh, who's my eldest daughter, she's she's very involved, and uh, so is Haley, who's my youngest daughter. She's very involved with the Gesha School and other uh, projects. So. You know, it's a family involvement. I can leave a greater legacy to my children than to hand over to them a major foundation that they're able to do good in our community, as well as the non-Jewish community. But 80% has to go to Jewish causes, both here and in Israel. The other 20%, which is still a lot of money, goes to English causes, whether it's from the Royal Ballet uh, or the Royal Opera House to the, the memorial to, I don't know, dozens of things which, which we do in the community. Also RNIB, which my wife is the uh, president of. She, so, you know, we are involved in a lot of things. All takes a lot of time and is involved in giving a lot of money away. But if we didn't have it, we couldn't give it away, could we? Okay, thank you very, very much for okay. answering the question. Nice and to meet you. Likewise. Thanks, Samuel. So now just a few more questions from me. Uh, and so number 14, kind of leading on from what you were saying. So you and your wife, Dame Gail, are leading philanthropists in the UK. But I suppose, and you touched on why you do it, but is in where does your passion to help the disadvantaged come from? Where were you first taught about the importance of giving and how much comes from your Jewish value? Well, I think, I think it comes from my Jewish values, family. Uh, and, you know, you have a responsibility. If you make a lot of money, you have a responsibility to put that back into, into your community into the wider society and <clears throat> I've always felt like that I mean I used to raise the money for uh, when in the, in the old days when it was uh, Jacob after the 62 group uh, to set up this defense organization which even in those days we needed a million pounds a year well where you know you don't find a million pounds you just put it out of the sky and I'm going back 60 years ago uh, when we when we found it because i realized it's not about hunting down fascists and 
beating them up and taking them off the streets. What it's about is building a responsible organization. This is across the board for the whole community. And that is a major responsibility. Did I know what I was taking on when I was a boy, 21, 22, 23? No, I didn't. But as it happens, you know, I built the organization up and developed it and developed it and developed the relationships with politicians, with government, with the prime ministers, with secretaries of state. You, you go on the list. I mean, I know all these people. It's not about bragging about it. And I know who the good people are who are Jew friendly. And I know the people who aren't. But we do need to make friends. The more friends we've got, non-Jews, in government, in the broader areas of the police, et cetera, et cetera, who then trust us, know that we are responsible and part of society. So. That's what we as Jews have to live up to and have to achieve because we're only a minority. You know, we're less than half of 1% of the whole of the people who live in this country. I think when we also look at kind of at your story, especially regarding what you did back in the 60s, and so, it's very important to remember that you were such a young man and kind of, and I think that's a very powerful message for a lot of the young people who are watching is, you've done so much and you've accomplished so much but consistently and so obviously that shows the makes immense strength i've earned my stripes put it that way <laughs> i'd say you've done a lot more than that the i think so i think my last well my penultimate question is if you could just sum up in one sentence what would you like your legacy to be I've been asked that question many times, you know, what would you like to have on your gravestone? Whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, I don't really have an answer to that question. I've got to be honest with you. I could, I could make up something that sounds good, but you know, I don't think of it. I'm, you know, I want, I suppose part of me wants to go on forever, which we all know we ain't going to go on forever. We're on borrowed time, but you know, I crack on doing what I'm doing. I've laid the foundations with that foundation which is very large and to be one of the largest Jewish foundations in the United Kingdom. And there, and with my daughters, they will carry on. They've got the responsibility. They don't have a problem about, them. they won't be running away from that responsibility to continue the legacy of the Ronson family. Is it? I think that's a very powerful, uh, very powerful message to end on. Though, unfortunately, that I do have one last question. Though, a bit, well, come on, a you, bit can, you can, you can, you can, Just, you can spit it out. <laughs> so, um, for my last question, we, we always ask our guests to nominate and ask another celebrity or community leader to be a future guest on our program to help entertain all the children and young people stuck at home. So if you've enjoyed tonight's experience, and we really do hope you have, who would you like to nominate tonight? Do you think you might be able to persuade your nephew, Mark Ronson, to join us? Uh, well, I might be able to. You drop me a note outside of this conversation now. Um, I, I will ask him to do it. Um, and I, I possibly can find you a couple of other people who are very successful, very involved in the community uh, and people who are very good Jews. So drop me a personal note tomorrow to the office and I'll come back to you. Right. Well, I think the only thing left to say is a massive thank you, Gerald, for joining us this evening and inspiring us all. And I think we've all loved hearing about your journey, your experiences, and how you've bounced, bounced back and led from the front. All of us are grateful for the work that you continue to do for our community and how, because of you, we are safe in our schools and in our synagogues. And we can, as you said, walk down the street with kippahs on our heads and pray in peace. And so on behalf of our president, Lord Levy, our trustees, staff, volunteers, and of course, all the young people and families watching. Thank you once again. Please stay safe, take care, 
and we hope to see you again very soon. All the best to you. Thank you. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you to everyone for tuning in this evening and yet again being part of history. A quick reminder that we're looking for everyone to get involved. So if you've got a special skill and would like to teach it on GLGB Virtual, much like the coding we saw today, please email virtual at glgb.org to get involved. And we will be back tomorrow when we will once again be playing bingo and doing more aerobics with Joe before a skills club with cartoonist pool and acts of kindness with Tayer. Then we have the pleasure of welcoming the amazing Rachel Antacone, the Chief Operating Officer at the Royal Free Hospital. Until then, keep well and good night.